Before we watch this documentary and critique it, I just want to explain to you so you have it in your mind why China is like this, why China encourages marriages young, why China wants women to marry young, why it has these terms for women like leftover women. Ultimately, you trace it back to history. What it is, is a way for people on the top to control the people on the bottom. If you have a family, you're probably gonna work, you're gonna contribute to the economy, got kids, got send your kids to school. If you have a wife and kids, what are you less likely to do? Leave, go off on your own, start your own thing, rebel. You're gonna think twice about all of that when you have existing attachments. So this system has perpetuated itself. One of the reasons people don't understand that the Chinese economy has grown so much and continues to grow is because they're forcing young people into basically servitude for the rest of their life. In China, you want to get married, eventually you're going to buy a house, etc. What if we artificially make the housing prices high? So now you buy a house, you get married, you spent 40 years trying to pay off that debt. So you spent 40 years working crazy hours contributing to the Chinese economy. You see where this is going? So when Vice is trying to make this a men versus women issue, they're completely missing the point, which is this is an architect of control issue. This is how historically Chinese culture, and we can even look at it from the West. West in its traditionalist mindset was like this too. This is how you control a society. You build these communities that are multi-generational thinking, but it's a limited mentality it's a limited scope of thinking so you're always perpetuating the same exact thing every generation and ultimately who benefits the most it's the rulers who are ruling over you who are telling you what to do collecting your hard-earned tax money that is what it is so I wanted to explain this now before we watch the documentary so you guys know I am not making this response to attack women or feminism well i am attacking feminism because it doesn't get the point of what everything is but i am not attacking women in this talk i hope you guys understand that so with that being said let's watch this vice documentary now that you know the lens that i'm explaining the world in because if you understand it's the rulers who need people to act a certain way to stay in power and people act a certain way not understanding that it's people above them getting these thoughts and then you have external factors like feminism trying to divide people on the bottom even more you'll start understanding why our society is so hard to change okay enough talk by me let's watch up until the communist revolution women were pretty much considered property and their feet were tied then mao when breaking the norms of social class and gender declared that women carry half the sky and gender equality was written into the Constitution. That is the biggest simplification I have ever heard. You know what happened before communism in China? There was another ruling party that's now in Taiwan. Those people ruled China and tried to modernize China too. They failed, they lost to the communists. But to say that before the communists, women were considered property is way too simplistic. I do not know if Vice just didn't have the time to distinguish or they didn't even do their research. You have to distinguish the cities versus the countryside. What the communists did really well and why they ultimately won the civil war in China was because they really got the countryside on their side. Whereas the nationalists, the other branch that was ruling China before the communists, they were very influential in the cities, but most of the Chinese population was rural at the time. So when the nationalists were in power, when the final dynasty of China was overthrown, they tried very hard, at least in the cities, to make women equal. They tried to end foot binding in the cities, but since they had no influence in the countryside, a lot of the countryside was still very traditionally patriarchal and paternal. So we have to make that nuanced distinction. You cannot give communism all the credit for creating equality in China. That is just so much BS. Since we're on this topic, I might as well read to you guys the part of the Chinese constitution that guarantees equal rights because it's actually really cool. It's the article 48 and it says equal rights for women. 
Women in the People's Republic of China enjoy equal rights with men in all spheres of life, political, economic, cultural, social, and family life. The state protects the rights and interests of women, applies the principle of equal pay for equal work for men and women alike, and trains and selects caters among women. You guys were very beautiful. So she's born in 1980, so she's actually... 35. Is it difficult for her to find a husband at that age? Conquinala,不管他长得多好,这个男同志啊,男孩的长女孩啊,他的条件我总觉得是个经验,就是什么呢?他找都是找年轻未婚,长得好,这三个条件缺一不可。这样,刚才那个老太太,就是他的女儿
many would-be daughters were aborted, meaning there are over 20 million more men than women in China. For a long time, uh, women, uh, they experienced terrible pain, personal pains, because of the one-child policy, a lot of forced abortions, that kind of situation. Come the paid attention to the negative consequences of this one-child policy only when uh, research shows, statistics shows, there's a terrible sex ratio imbalance. So this segment's really interesting. It's talking about the terrible problems that women have experienced under the one-child law. I'm not going to discount that. It's true. It's hard. You're not regarded as highly sometimes, especially in more traditional patriarchal families, because you're not passing on the family name. They, by the way, did not mention that here. But you know what this channel does. We like to explore all sides. So let's talk about the other side of it because it's not easy for a man to think about it like this let's say the family they might have gotten rid of a few girls so they had one girl and then secretly they had another boy now all their hopes all their aspirations everything's on the boy is that fair to the boy maybe he's not that ambitious Maybe he just wants to chill. Maybe he's not that smart, but the boy's expected to take care of the parents when he's older. The boy's expected this and that and that. And I'll tell you this, this is something probably if you haven't lived in a culture that had a one-child policy and also favoritism towards males, you probably have never seen this. If you have a girl or you keep having girls and you can't have the boy, your parents get mad at you as a man, too. I know stories of fathers. They wanted to keep their daughter because they love their daughter. They want to abort or force their wives to abort another daughter. As a man, you have to deal with that. You're the man of the family. There's all this pressure from your parents to have a son. Maybe you just want a daughter. Maybe you think one son's good enough. No, but your parents want to dictate to you, oh yeah, all these cultural things. I need another son, blah, blah, blah. So you're the head of your household, according to the family structure, but you're not really the head of the household. Of, there's always pressure from above, especially if you have a girl. I know stories. The man of the household is like, it's okay if I have two daughters. We already went over by one. The government, if they find out, they're going to punish us. So why should I try to have another kid just to make you happy? And you know what the father does? The father of the father smacks him in the face. This black and white thing that Vice is trying to do of making it seem like, oh yeah, women are oppressed. It's a lot more nuanced than that. Despite the real issue being the leftover men, it's still the women who are berated for leaving their villages to try their luck in the cities where they can marry up or pursue a career, leaving millions of poor working men unable to find a spouse. Do you think I have good options to find a boyfriend? That right there was an example of extremely bad editing. They planted an amazing issue, which is that there seems to be this double standard when it comes to women leaving the village versus men leaving the village. And then they do not keep exploring that. They planted this issue, this, this, this like social issue of women leaving the villages behind, all these men left over in these villages. And then it cuts the reporter on an issue that's not related at all to what they just, the issue they were just talking about. Women are expected to stay in the village, stay in the city, marrying someone local. It's less customary and looked down upon even, maybe in the old days, less now, for the woman to, let's say, go to a big city and just do something. I have family members like that. One of my mom's cousins, she came to visit us, the city where I was born, and she didn't want to leave, but her father had a man planned for her to marry and she was crying she didn't want to leave but ultimately it's her father her father whatever her father says goes so she really had fond memories of my hometown because it was a big city it was very different from the countryside that she was living in on a side note what's really funny was that when she was visiting my mom she helped babysit me a lot i was really small i was just starting to walk and she was a very bad babysitter like she was a very bad nanny and she told me that I would just run and she, she wouldn't have energy to chase after me. So I'd run and fall on my head. And 
she'd be too afraid to tell my mom. She'd be afraid my mom would be mad at her. So I probably fell on my head at least 50 to 100 times as a little kid. And I like to joke to my parents that's why I get concussed so easily in martial arts because I have so much brain damage from being a kid. It's probably why I'm so weird. And it's probably why I, I'm not like a real Chinese person deep down at heart. I got too brain shook to be a conformist. The point of telling the story is that she wanted to marry up. She could have married up. In fact, my parents probably wanted to help her marry up. Again, it's your family member, right? You want to help them get the best life. So they could have probably helped her find a city girl. And the way it works in China is that since she was in the countryside, she had no city hukou, which means she had no city ID. So by marrying someone in the city, she can get a city ID. So her life would have changed. Man, it would have just been so different. That's not how it worked back then in the 90s. So she had to go back to the countryside, marry some random dude. Apparently he's not a good dude either, but I haven't met him, so I'm not going to judge. That in itself is something that's worth exploring. See, I just spoke for something like three minutes about that, but no, they didn't explore that issue again. Now it's about the reporter, and she's going to try her hand at the marriage market. Age of a man important? And is it important that the man earns more money? Again, what is implied here is fertility. If you're a man, you want a younger woman because there's more chances that she's very fertile. She can have a baby, especially for a traditional society like this where marriage 99 out of 100 times will lead to kids. But they don't really talk about that issue because they don't want to say fertility and angry all lefties. And then the second part, they're talking about have to have local property in Beijing. That needs a cultural explanation. Because remember before I talked about how in the city you have a special city ID? This is something that Vice never explained in this documentary. But every city has an ID. What that means is in China, you're tied to where you're born. It's not like in America. You can live anywhere. You can go anywhere. If I don't like LA, I can move to Phoenix, Arizona. Join my bro, Zach King. Anytime. Anytime. But in China, let's say I'm from Chengdu, so I would have a Chengdu ID. If I wanted to go to Beijing, I would not be able to buy property there. I would not be able to settle down there because my hukou, my ID is a Chengdu ID. You see, this is something very important that they do not explain this documentary. To them, it's just like, oh yeah, you have to have local property. What's the big deal? The big deal is women, a lot of them are transplants to a big city like Beijing, if you marry someone who's a local or has a local ID, you're more likely to get the local ID too, or you're not more likely you're going to get the local ID. So you see, there's an element of hypergamy that's built into this that's not explained because I don't know if the documentary makers know about the differences between residency and city and country and all that ID that exists in China. Now that was a pretty great moment, right? That was a pretty verite, candid moment. A white girl privilege denied. White girl privilege absolutely denied. <laughs> I'm just being funny, but it's, it's like, oh, I'm a pretty little white girl, even though I'm in my 30s, whatever. These guys can make an exception, but again, this is a marriage market, right? They're thinking about, okay, it's exotic looking, but culturally she's different and she's old as fuck. You know, not for life just old as fuck for marriage. That movie with Seth Rogen where the bouncer said the same thing. Hey, you old as fuck, not, not for this world, just for this club or something like that. It's not because you're not hot. I would love to tap that ass. I would tear that ass up. I can't let you in because you old as fuck. For this club, not, you know, for the earth.
We wanted to find out what a day in the life was like for one of China's so-called leftover women. So we met up with a young professional in Beijing. Actually, I'm just a TOEFL speaking teacher and listening teacher. Was this like your aspiration? Like, was this a job that you always wanted to do? Yeah, I mean, I like teaching because I like help people. Yeah, you know, it's just like two way street. Yeah, I can teach them something and they can just uh, teach me something in a different way. Now that lady is an interesting choice because she's much more relatable to the Western audience. She speaks perfect English. She's very attractive, so the Western audience is, wow, wow. But I will guarantee you, she does not represent the majority of these leftover women. This is a very interesting person they picked. Here's what I think, because I used to work in news. Probably what happened was they needed someone quick. They're like, okay, who can we? And then they probably just, through their connections, contacted someone. When you're on a deadline writing news, doing documentary, you're just trying to fulfill all the quotas, fulfill all the criteria. So we need an expert, let's find whatever expert. We need someone to interview, let's find whoever's easy. That's the key. So of course they're going to pick someone like this, but the problem like with someone like this is I will guarantee you she probably has studied abroad. She probably has even lived a long time abroad. She's got a cultural difference between her and let's say the majority of the people around her. And on top of that, knowing she's seen more of the world than most of her peers, she probably has way higher standards. And the thing is, you can study abroad somewhere and never really get the culture of the place. You can just hang out with fellow Asians, but knowing her language is that good, I'm gonna assume she didn't. She probably hung out with other ethnicities, other nationalities. Now I'm even gonna make a jump and say she probably has hooked up with white guys or other types of guys. So it really creates a really, really high standard in this woman in particular. So it's easy to watch this and be like, oh my God, she's so qualified. Why don't Chinese men like her? But very, very likely she has her own really, really high standards that are not being met. Everything culturally, financially, sexually, everything. The other day I just celebrated my own birthday. I caught my grandpa and he just uh, said something like, you know, cliche again, like, hey, you're getting old. Yeah, I was like, seriously, I'm only 26. And then he said, come on, go find a reliable boyfriend. Oh, you're not, you know, you, you, you don't have to set your bar too high because you're not that good enough. <laughs> and yeah, and he's just using this strategy. He wants me to live a good life, right? But I feel like what's different is that, is that I feel like finding boyfriends is not only issue in my life. That right there, people, is also not a man versus woman story. That's just what grandparents do, all right? Grandparents, they're two generations out of touch from what's modern. So of course they're gonna say stupid stuff. My grandma, last time I saw her, she's like, Jerry, man, um, there's this girl that I wanna introduce you to her. She's super, super pretty. She doesn't have a high school education, but you know, she's super, super pretty and I'm sure she knows how to do the dishes. She literally said that to me. I kind of laughed. I didn't say anything to her because she's like 90, right? I'm not trying to give her a heart attack, but in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, this is what grandparents do. They just think so lowly of their kids, but they're really thinking highly of them, but not understanding how to express it. I'm just laughing because what my grandmother was basically saying was, yeah, you know, don't put your standards too high. Just find someone who can do the dishes and cook and you'll be fine. And of course I got standards too, right? So I'm just telling the story, guys, because if you don't hear the male side of things, you're going to think, oh, yeah, it's only the grandparents putting pressure on the women. And my grandmother's a smart woman, man. She's the last one that I would have expected to say that kind of stuff. I don't care if you didn't go to college, but at least you should have graduated high school. That's just my opinion. But she was like, oh, yeah, that girl didn't even graduate high school, but she's pretty. Come on, Grandma. Today is Chinese Valentine's Day, and we're at an amusement park where there's going to be a speed dating event taking place. And I'm going to find out what the details are for registering. Uh, but it seems like people will have to wear paper bags. The speed dating event was organized by a matchmaking agency infamous for a TV ad aimed at so-called left of women, which sparked public outcry on Chinese social media. So what Vice failed to mention in that segment 
was the company that made the ad, Baihe, is actually a Chinese dating site. So let's think about this from a dating company's perspective. If they need to get people to come on your site, what are they gonna do? They're probably gonna sell you on the fact that being in a relationship's awesome, being single sucks. You're picking an ad that's made by a dating company, online dating company, and you're trying to say and justify some kind of national Chinese attitude towards women and relationships, etc. So this is either a cherry picking of data or let's give Vice a benefit of the doubt. It's just lazy reporting. So this is by Ho Wang. This is the website. Look at that. This is the dating site. The thing about Chinese websites is that because China almost made the direct jump from no internet to cell phone smartphones, so many web pages are not customized for the web browsing. They're customized for the phone. I'm sure if we browse this site on the smartphone, it would actually look much prettier. This does not appeal to me. It just looks so amateur. It looks 2000s-y. But this is Baihe. This is the website that made that commercial. Think about it like this. If eHarmony were to advertise its product, would it try to say, oh, dating sucks. Oh, yeah, you should stay single. No, it wouldn't. It would just like this commercial talk about how, oh, yeah, it sucks, man. It sucks to be single. You need to be in a relationship because that's what it's trying to sell you on. Look at this. So it's claiming it has 100 million people on there. Hey, to all my white guys with Asian fetishes. If you guys want to meet Asian women, you guys should sign up. Although it looks like you need a Chinese cell phone number, so. Can't meet your Chinese woman here. So I'm looking for somebody who'll make me laugh, and who's intelligent, and who reads a lot of books. They clearly didn't get my criteria for what I was looking for in a partner. Because your criteria is bullshit. It's made up to seem like you're some enlightened person, but if we see if you practice what you preach, you probably are not gonna practice what you preach. That's why these men are surprised. Women in China are super realistic. They're super brutal about what they want. In a way, it sucks, but in a way it's like, well, at least I know she's not BSing me. So that's why. I will guarantee if you're this reporter, reach out to me if you really have only dated guys who make you laugh, like to read books, and you you didn't make exception for like really good looking guys or you know really strong looking men or something. Seriously, if you really practice what you preach and I'm wrong, I love to be proven wrong, man. The reason they all reacted that way is because they've probably been told that all the time by girls. Oh yeah, I want this and that and that. But the moment it's time for her to use her mind, she uses the other parts of her mind that are not logical. Young men, they are also victims of this highly sexist gender norms. How to be a masculine man, what is success of masculine man, it's all related to money and the house and the cars. If you don't have any possessions or any of these material goods, you are not a real man and then you cannot marry any woman. I picked out this segment because I think it was the only segment in this documentary, this 30 minute documentary that did anything to talk about the plight of men. If feminism is really about equality, if it's really about empowering everyone, then this is not equality, giving about a 20 second sound bite to men, and then the rest of the documentary is about, oh, how it sucks for women in China. So feminism is equality, that's been debunked at least by this documentary. <laughs> Very beginning of this talk, I was telling you, it's not a freaking men versus women issue. It's an issue of control. It's a class issue. Why do those men have to adhere to these arbitrary standards? It's because the people on the top tell them this is what it is. Think about this another way. The people who rule China, all those sons and grandsons of the founders of 1949 afterwards China, do you think they really go around caring about all this stuff? No, they're so rich, they have so much power, they don't have to care about, oh yeah, I have to work really hard to buy a house so a woman will marry me. They have like 10 houses and they have all this property and they have stocks in all these major companies. They don't care. They're just putting these things into the minds of people below them so those people will stay productive members of society. You see where this is getting at? In the socialist period, anger was a symbol of women's double liberation from gender and class hierarchies. From my childhood on, 
All the films portrayed revolutionary heroines, all strong women. Historically, women in China couldn't receive formal education, and you had no right to be in politics. Uh, it was the socialist revolution, especially the feminists in the social revolution, they fought very hard to uh, sweep away that kind of mentality. Um, but unfortunately, uh, in the 1980s, um, it, it's revived. You know why men and women both needed to work under communist China? It was because people were starving, people were poor, because communism doesn't work. So in the 80s, according to the documentary, when women were encouraged to stay in the house again, it's because China embraced capitalism. And you know what happens with capitalism? Usually the value of everything, the economy gets better, everyone's income gets raised. Sure, the rich get much richer than the poor get richer, but everyone's income gets raised. The point is, the sign that women were encouraged to stay in the house again to be part of a family unit or whatever, that's not necessarily always interpreted as a bad thing, like these leftist vice people do. If only a man is needed to support the family financially, then why should the woman work also? She can stay at home with her kids if she wants. She can do other things if she wants. But for some reason, that is always negatively connoted in all these documentaries. Oh man, they're encouraging women to stay at home again. Well, we don't know what the cause is. We don't know. Well, we're just going to assume it's sexism. We're going to assume it's to make women look bad. We're assuming it's to make women oppressed. Think about what happened to America under second wave feminism. At first, the wages were enough Barely enough, but it was enough for a man to support his family. Then you encourage women into the workforce. So what happens when you have double the number of employees now? Well, the companies can take more advantage of workers because workers are even more replaceable. And we can lower the wages because we don't have to afford to pay one worker as much as before. So for the sake of forcing equality, it's not necessarily a good thing. The 1980s was China's reform period, during which former leader Deng Xiaoping opened up China to foreign investment. After China embraced the global capitalism, um, people will see, oh, wow, China, you know, economic development is a miracles everywhere, you know. Um, the GDP now, China ranked number two, you know. But most people did not pay attention to the other side of the story. That is the polarization class and also the gap between men and women has been increased drastically. Again, because women are oppressed, right? That's always the conclusion and the cause. The cause and the conclusion always that women are oppressed. Maybe, okay, as the markets and the government opened up, so it was not as much central planning, and people got to decide more what they wanted to do. Maybe there was a tendency for men to select certain jobs and women to select certain jobs. That's a very logical other explanation. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying you can interpret this from a non-sexism man versus woman angle. And of course, you mention polarization of class and then you never talk about it again. Even under communism, people are supposed to be equal, but the rulers still had more power, more resources than the people they were ruling. So when you opened up your market and then entrepreneurship, capitalism started, who benefited the most? Of course, the rulers still benefited the most, right? Why? Because they had all the power. So if you want to start a business, you probably need to rub shoulders with the rulers. You probably need to rub shoulders with people who could shut down your business the next day. So inevitably, no matter what, the people on top, whatever you call them, the Communist Party or whatever, basically, they're just another iteration of a royal ruling class that China has had for 5,000 years. Those people are always going to be the ones on top to get the most of the riches. That's just how it works in China. But of course, you don't explain that. It's all men versus women. So today's young women, they have all the resources. They were princesses uh, in their one-child families, right? And they thought they could do everything. You know, they used to be the center of the universe. You know. But as soon as they graduate from school, they already experienced gender discrimination. And they thought, oh, yeah, I can do everything, anything, you know. But now in the society, it's like, oh, no. No, you are, you, are, you are a secondary citizen in this country, you know. No matter how excellent you are, how capable you are, but in the larger society's mind, you're not as good as a man. So I'm going to give you guys a nuance here. This is something that 
if you haven't lived in China, you probably haven't seen this phenomenon. A lot of women in China, they have their two kids or their one kid. And then after the kids are old enough to be babysat or kind of even stay at home by themselves, then they go back into the workforce. Here's why. You have to look at it also from a business perspective. I know businesses are taught to be evil, especially in the West. We have this leftist mentality that businesses, entrepreneurs, everything, corporations, they're all evil. Let's just pretend they're not evil. They're not evil, but if you think they're evil, just humor me. Pretend they're not evil. Look at it from their perspective. They have to make money. They have to survive, profit and loss, etc. And this is not me saying. This is what Chinese people say. This is what companies directly say. If you hire women and you know they're probably going to have two kids because the family values say you got to have two kids, that's going to take them out of your company, out of the workforce for a little bit. And in fact, family values are so strong in China, which is good. They want to be good mothers, which is good. They want to raise good kids, which is good. So on average, Chinese women take more time off when they're pregnant and giving birth and raising the kid than their Western counterparts, which is awesome because I don't know how many cringeworthy times I've seen women, they had a kid a week ago, they're back working already. That is doing so much harm to your body. It's doing so much harm to the kid too. But even if you can't think about it from the kid's angle, just think about it from your angle. You just carried a kid for nine months. Your body needs rest. You should not be working, doing anything stressful to your body for at least two to three months after you give birth to your kid. In fact, there's a thing in China, it's called zhuozi. What it means is after giving birth, the woman does not do anything, literally does not do anything for a month. Now, I think it's taken to the extreme, but it has a lot of scientific validity because the baby, as it's developing in your womb, has a lot of stem cells, so it's growing but it's also repairing the mother. Your mother needs to survive too, so it's repairing the mother. So what you're doing when you take a rest, really rest and revive after you have a kid is you're allowing all that damage from pregnancy to be repaired. When Chinese women what they do is they literally don't do anything for a month. Scientifically, they don't know it, but this is the scientific reason, but just from a traditional angle, they're just like, oh yeah, I just have to rest. What Chinese women do is they don't cook, they don't socialize, they don't drink cold water, they don't experience temperature extremes, they don't experience sun extremes, they don't experience anything that could potentially harm their body's repair. So they spend this one month to repair themselves. And I think that's one of the reasons I will hypothesize that people think Asian women age slower. It's because they take care of their bodies much more after birth. You will not be saying women who are in Asia going back to the workplace a week after giving birth. That is so harmful. Okay, so we've explained that. We've explained there seems to be this culture that you got to let your body stay healthy. You have to let your body repair itself. Bao yang, tiao yang, as they say in Chinese. There's also this culture of, okay, if I'm going to give birth, I got to be a mother to my kid. That means a woman is going to be out of the workforce for a long time. So now if you're a company, think about it from that angle and you're thinking, okay, I understand that every worker I'm investing some time and money into them for them to give me whatever I need. What is a better investment? A man who I can work way harder, who doesn't have to pop out babies, or a woman? This might offend some people, but this is just how they think without the guise of political correctness. If you think like that, then yes, there might be a little bit of discrimination, if you use that word, towards women. At least women who haven't given birth to the quota of children that are allotted or allowed under the Chinese system. But I will tell you, all the women I know who've had their kids, who are now back in the workplace, are respected and treated as equals, if not even treated better than men. Because now it's like they can work hard and also they've had this experience with childbirth and raising kids, so they can withstand way more than men can. So it's very nuanced. It's not like women automatically regarded as second-class citizens, men automatically regarded as first-class citizens. It's nuanced. This issue is very, very nuanced. 
But of course, Vice doesn't have time or it's just too lazy. I don't know which is which to explore all of this. So the impression you get here is, oh my God, yeah, women can't have anything, man. Oh my God, yeah. After they enter the workplace, it sucks for them. Ah. Uh. She said it's a battle between civil society and government. So she's almost there, man. She's almost on the ball. But of course, she's only thinking narrowly about feminists. By the way, this lady that's interviewed is a feminist. She kind of understands it. She kind of gets it in a very limited context. But it's all about the government wants to control you. Wants to control how you think. The government wants to control how you act. And anything that doesn't agree with its ideology and its expectation of you, it'll deem radical. Certain religions, basically every religion, certain movements, certain thoughts, etc. So I wish she took this very small brilliance given to her and just thought about the world from beyond a man versus women lens. Because then you'll see where it's at. If everyone allowed themselves to think differently and if you allowed all kinds of thought, you would get a cooler society. Maybe the society wouldn't grow the way China's grown, but I think people's morals, people's spirituality, people's sense of fulfillment would grow tenfold. And it's really sad that this feminist right here looks exactly like your stereotypical feminist that's portrayed by the right. It's got the glasses, got the hair, and everything, and got the t-shirt. I do know some feminists that are cute, man. I know quite some feminists that are cute, but I don't know why the cute feminists never are the ones talking on camera. I guess they don't have that much of a chip on their shoulder because they at least are feminine and they can get guys' attention. Anyways, let's keep watching. I think I'm really, really a good girl and a good citizen. I just want to do something good for our society. You know, in China, how can you not to be a feminist when you face so much discrimination and when you saw so much violence unequal to women. In my experience, domestic violence is a big issue for women to face. According to the UN, more than 50% of Chinese men abuse their partners. And marital rape is not a crime in China. I was a victim of domestic violence. My, my mother suffered uh, domestic violence when I was young. So that's, that's how I became a feminist. First of all, domestic violence is a huge, horrible issue. It does happen everywhere. I am not disputing that. But Vice tosses out a 50%. So I try to look for that piece of data. 50% of women in China experience domestic violence. I found a feminist organization in China called the All China Women's Federation. According to the All China, so this is a Chinese feminist organization. So I don't think they have an incentive to distort the numbers. They say it's about 24.7% of women have experienced some form of domestic violence. So I actually feel like that's a better data. One in four, man. That's still one in four. That's a lot. But saying 50%, I feel like that was just, yeah, that was pulled out of their butt. That does not make sense. So this also says that apparently 5.5% state clearly that they have experienced physical abuse. I believe if I'm understanding what Vice was trying to say, if you account just yelling, so like a husband berating or yelling at the woman, then it goes as high as 50%. But when you use the term domestic violence, most people think actual physical hitting and stuff like that. So that is definitely not 50%. So... This is either lazy writing, lazy editing, or whatever, or purposeful by advice. By not explaining clearly what you mean by domestic violence, you're making it seem like one in two Chinese husbands hit their wives, which is just, that is totally wrong. But anyways, I will link to you this. This is 
much more nuanced and much more interesting because it's not just one number. The early feminists, you know, who joined the revolution, they experienced so much hardship. They already established all these mechanisms, policies, everything, social institutions, everything, but that can be dismantled. So right now, the generation of young women found themselves again in a worse situation than my, my generation, right? So they have to refight a battle. Every generation had to fight a battle to pursue a society of justice and equality. Everybody has to fight. I cannot believe that they continue to give communism credit in China. Vice, are you trying to air in China? Is that why you keep doing this? Communism destroyed China's culture. It destroyed China's history. It destroyed family values. It led to more people dead than Hitler killed combined. Communism led to a lot of bad stuff and you're giving it credit for making women equal? Yeah, equally starving, equally dead under a system that cared about nothing. You're taking all these current phenomenon that's going on in China and you're thinking it's because we need feminism. No, it's not. It's because communism destroyed existing morality and it destroyed all the good stuff that China had. China had a lot of bad cultural institutions too, but what communism did by tossing out everything, killing all the scholars, killing everything in the old ways, was that it tossed out all the good in China too. And now you're trying to substitute all of this with a Western brand of delusional men versus women paradigm. Do you think that's gonna save China? While you're complaining, while you have this man versus woman paradigm shoved down your throats by the West, the people on top are just laughing in your face. But maybe we can give credit to this too. Because unbeknownst to a lot of these feminists, whether in China, whether in the West, it's kind of a brilliant strategy by the West to subvert other cultures. Because you have other cultures, they're different than how America works, and then you get all these Western women going in and be like, oh, you guys need feminism, man. We got to change everything up. Everything is unfair. It'll lead to disruptions in whatever culture, right? It's brilliant. If it is true, people, that communism really led to great feminism as in great gender equality, then who's to say that feminism wasn't actually planted by really lefty people to the West in the first place. Suddenly, I just got that thought. Again, I have no basis on this, but it just seems like if all this is true, feminism really led to great men versus women, gender balance, sure, everyone's starving, but you know, it was another way of thinking of things. And if I were some communist leader, let's say in Russia, in China, or in Albania, or whatever, wouldn't I try to use some of those ideas to kind of undermine Western society. Maybe I can at least change up the gender dynamics in the country so that way they start eating themselves from within. Guys, what do you think about that? I mean, I have no basis on this, okay? But it just seems to me we like to think that feminism was some brilliant Western thing that came about, but potentially it's got more cynical origins. The current level of feminism, I get first wave feminism very likely started in the West, but second wave feminism, third wave feminism, how much of it was actually planted? I mean, we know Russians affected our election, right? Trump was elected, maybe I would give Russians 20% of the credit for distorting public opinion. So how much of this current third wave, fourth wave feminism was planted into the West by subversive elements in other culture? They can't beat us with their military and their nukes. So they have to do what the West has been doing, which is called a cultural war. You make them love your values and what you stand for by Hollywood and all that beautiful stuff. So when people think about you, they think about that. So what's to say other elements, non-Western elements can't do some of that back to the West? Okay, well, they're trying to sell their Coca-Cola and their Charlie's Angels to us. So let's sell them this knockoff brand of feminism so they can implode from within. Guys, I'm having way too much fun with this video. I'm getting off topic. But this was a very interesting exploration into China, into men-women issues, into the fact that maybe we should think beyond that and ultimately, the people ruling China don't care about any of this, man. If 
they need to, they will ban you. They can take down the richest people. They can take down the most powerful people in China. So this is nothing. Feminism in China is only allowed to happen because the people ruling allow it to happen. To every feminist watching this video, you got to understand this. The only reason you guys are making any headway is because the people on top are like, oh, you know, if it keeps certain single women kind of doing something and not causing more trouble, then yeah, give them something to think about and do give them little vagina monologues to go and rally against. But keep it at that. The world is much more complicated than a male versus female paradigm. You have to realize that people in power have a tendency to want to stay in power. Why? Because you get a lot of benefits from having power. You get a lot of benefits from having a lot of resources. No one wants to give up on that. I'm not even trying to say people are evil. I'm just saying it's just part of self-interest. If you have any kind of power, you have any kind of influence, you have any kind of resource, you're probably very invested in continuing building that up or at least maintaining the constants of it. The problem is a lot of times if you try to just maintain the constants, you inevitably just spiral downward. So you have to either be growing or declining. And of course, everyone chooses growing. I'm not trying to start some conspiracy. I'm not trying to start some class communist warfare or whatever. You have to understand why certain systems and certain changes in history happen because there is an ounce of truth to at least the diagnosis of the problem. And I do agree with a lot of people when they say there's definitely class clashes. And China's always been a hierarchical society. It's always been, you got your emperor, you got his family, you got the closest advisors slash people that are married to the family. And then you have all these officials, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's a layer and layer and layer and layer. And of course, it's always the majority of the people on the bottom of the pyramid. The hardest workers die early. They never get anything out of life. And they're always the ones being controlled. And the difference now with capitalism the people on the bottom aren't working fields anymore. They might have a slightly better quality of life than before, but ultimately they're still in a country that doesn't always take their incentives in mind. They're still in a country where they can't even really vote or elect their leaders or really make the decision as to where the country's going. On top, there's no longer an emperor. It's more like an aristocratic group of, let's say, 100 families now that kind of have wars with each other up there and struggles and clashes until one or two sides emerge. So the current system is probably more sustainable in the long run in China because the problem with the emperor system back in the day, the imperial system in China, was that you'd have one good emperor and then his son might be good and then they just keep getting worse and worse because they get more and more sheltered, good times create weak men. So you get less and less capable people managing the country until it falls and then a new family takes over. That's how it used to be in China. But I think they realized you have to design an institution that hedges against the dumb third or fourth or fifth generation. So what you end up doing now in China is instead of one family ruling, you have a bunch of families and the families keep each other in check because they're always having little struggles. People think China's government is a one-party system where they're all in agreement. That is so false. It's like Game of Thrones. And I can make a video about this, explaining to you guys the different sides, the different people. There's There used to be three cliques, and now there's two. It's really interesting. That's a video for another time. The key is the modern Chinese system, it's hedging itself against the weaknesses of a one-person type of rule. And the Chinese system's not perfect. No one knows if it might fall one day. But the key is if vice, whether it's doing it consciously or unconsciously, is trying to plant certain seeds like feminism in China to disrupt it, you have to know you're not making a difference. The people on top the next day can just be like, okay, any word that has to do with feminism, blocked from the internet, blocked from publication, any single person that we've tracked through their phone activities and their online banking activities that had anything to do with feminism, let's go follow them, let's put them in detention, let's talk to them. Dude, it's so easy to crack down on any of this. So in my humble, non-expert opinion for all Western politicians that might have interest in this video, you gotta be smarter if you're gonna try to infiltrate China and destroy it from within. It's not that easy. This system, 
did not fall for 4,000 years. It's not going to fall now because of feminism. In fact, in 2017, when I was in China, I heard that one of the big topics during the annual meeting of all the people on top was they wanted to discuss how they deal with feminism. They can see the disruption it's had in places like the West. And they're like, okay, what lessons can we learn from their mistakes, right? Smart people learn from other people's mistakes. They don't learn from their own mistakes. You don't have to repeat the same mistakes. Anyways, I talked for a while. This was a really interesting documentary. For the sake of fair use, there's a lot more of this documentary. So for the sake of fair use, I have to encourage you guys to go watch the original documentary too. This is my critique. It's my transformative views on this original. It does not substitute for the original. I hope you guys understand that. So, Vice, if you see this, I would love to interview that cute little Russian little looking reporter. And if you guys want to respond to me, please let me know. All right, thank you guys so much. Talk to you guys soon. This was Jerry, fellow lunatics, aka Zuan Shi Wang Lao Wu. Thank you for watching. Oh, oh I'm awful sorry. So am I. Oh. <laughs> Oh, 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 quit playing out. around in there and get that ring. Oh, 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 oh get me out of here. Get, get me out, out of here. That oh, dummy. Oh, 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 oh. He's all tangled up with wire. All right, we'll back him up and we'll break him out of here. Oh, my, oh, oh, my, 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 oh,